Welcome to the Daily Current Affairs by Civics and Tires, where we try to discuss the important articles from the Hindu, the Indian Express and the PIB, from the UPSC CSE prelims perspective. Displayed are the list of articles which we are going to discuss in today's video. The first article of the day says that the Indian Meteorological Department on Monday said that the well-marked low pleasure area over the Bay of Bengal, which is likely to be intensified into a severe cyclonic storm, would cross uh, North Odisha and West Bengal coast between Puri and Sagar Island during the night of 24th October and early morning of 25th October. In this context, let us talk about cyclones. See, cyclones are atmospheric disturbances characterized by rapid and often destructive air circulation around a low pressure area. Know that they are typically accompanied by violent storms, high winds and bad weather. So, in the northern hemisphere, the air circulates inward in an anti-clockwise direction, while in the southern hemisphere, it circulates clockwise. Then, cyclones are classified into two types, which are the extratropical cyclones. We can also call them as the temperate cyclones and tropical cyclones. Know that the term cyclone is derived from the Greek word cyclos, meaning coils of a snake, coined by Henry Peddington, to describe the storm patterns in Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea, which resemble a coiled serpent. Talking about the cyclone classifications, firstly the extratropical cyclones which occur in the temperate and high altitude regions high latitude regions and known to originate in the polar regions. Then the tropical cyclones uh, which develop between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Know that the large scale weather systems uh, develop over tropical or subtropical waters uh, forming surface wind circulation. Furthermore, it is uh, powered by heat from the sea and driven by the winds such as easterly trades and temperate westerlies. Significantly, the World Meteorological Organization defines uh, Tropical cyclones are weather systems with in winds exceeding gale force. These are, the cy these are the cyclone terminology across various regions. The second article of the day says that with the Delhi's air quality entering the very poor category on Monday, with an air quality index of 3 ton up from Sunday's 277 in poor category, 11 point action plan as per stage 2 of the graded response action plan has kicked on. In this context, let us talk about the Air Quality Index. See, the Air Quality Index in India is a tool designed to provide the public uh, with real-time information about the quality of air in their localities. Know that the Air Quality Index system categorizes air quality into six levels, ranging from good, which is 0 to 50, to severe, which is 400 plus, providing an easily understandable way to assess the impact of pollution on health. So the categories are good, uh, which amounts to 0 to 50, Satisfactory 51 to 100, moderate 101 to 200, poor 201 to 300, very poor 301 to 400, and severe which is 401 to 500. Significantly, the air quality index is based on the concentrations of 8 key pollutants, which are particulate matter 10 or the PM10, particulate matter 2.5 or the PM2.5, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, and lead. Know that each pollutant's concentration is converted into a numerical scale that reflects its health impact and the pollutant with the highest score determines the overall air quality index for that location. The third article of the day says that expressing delight on the Bhutanese PM sharing a talk base ride on a green hydrogen fuel cell bus, the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi today remarked the green hydrogen fuel cell bus was part of India's efforts to boost sustainability and contribute to a greener future for the coming generations. In this context, let us talk about the National Green Hydrogen Mission and then about Green Hydrogen. Firstly, talking about the National Green Hydrogen Mission. See, the intent of the mission is to incentivize the commercial production of green hydrogen and make India a net exporter of the fuel. Know that the mission will facilitate demand creation, production, utilization and export of green hydrogen. Furthermore, the mission has laid out a target to develop green hydrogen production capacity of at least 5 million metric ton per annum. Notably, this is alongside adding renewable energy capacity of about 125 gigawatt in the country. Also, there are two umbrella submissions under the program. The first is the Strategic Interventions for Green Hydrogen Transition Program, in short called a SITE, that will fund the domestic manufacturing of electrolyzers and produce green hydrogen. Then the second is to support the pilot projects in emerging end-use sectors and production pathways. Know that the nodal ministry is the ministry of new and renewable energy. Now, if we have to talk about the green hydrogen, 
See, the hydrogen is a key industrial fuel that has a variety of applications, including the production of ammonia, steel, refineries, and electricity. So, the green hydrogen is when the hydrogen is produced by electrolysis, the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen with uh, electricity generated from renewable energy sources such as solar or wind. Significantly, this is the most environmentally sustainable way of producing hydrogen. However, all of the hydrogen manufactured now is so-called black or brown hydrogen produced from coal. Furthermore, the grey hydrogen is produced from natural gas, while the blue hydrogen is from the fossil fuel sources where ensuring carbon emitted is captured via carbon capture processes. The fourth article of the day says that Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi today commemorated the 8th anniversary of UDAN, which stands for Uday Desh Ke Aam Agrik scheme that has revolutionized India's aviation sector. In this context, let us talk about various aspects related to it. See, it was launched on October 21st of 2016 under the Ministry of Civil Aviation. Significantly, it aims to enhance the regional air connectivity from unserved and undeserved airports in the India making air travel affordable for the masses. Know that it is inspired by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's vision to democratize air travel. Udan sought to make air travel accessible for everyone, including the common man. So the first Udan flight took off on April 27 of 2017, connecting Shimla and Delhi. Moving on to look at the key features of the Udan scheme. See, it is a market-driven model, which uh, means that the airlines bid for the routes based on demand receiving support through viability gap funding and concessions from airport operators, the central and the state governments. Furthermore, for the airport operators, waiving landing and parking charges, discounted terminal navigation landing charges and route navigation facilitation charges. Then the central government capped the excise duty on aviation turbine fuel at the RCS airports, incentivized code sharing agreements. Next, the state governments reduced VAT on ATF provided essential services at reduced rates. Next, it led to the emergence of regional airlines which have benefited from Udan. Furthermore, the scheme has also led to the growth demand for new aircraft with Indian carriers placing orders for over 1000 new aircraft. Next, Udan 3.0 focused on connecting tourism routes in the Northeast. Additionally, Udan 5.1 expanded helicopter services to remote hilly areas to promote the tourism. Furthermore, destinations such as Kajuraho, Diogar, and Kishangar have been made more accessible. Moving on to talk about the connectivity and infrastructure growth. See, Udan has operationalized 86 aerodromes across 34 states and United Territories. Furthermore, airports in locations like Darbanga, Jasurudguda, and Tezu have flourished, serving thousands of passengers and contributing to regional economic growth. Then the number of operational airports have doubled from 74 in 2014 to 157 in 2024 with a target of reaching 350 to 400 by 2047. The next article talks about a Stevia study by IA, IASST of Govati. See, if you have to talk about the key findings of the study, see, a recent study highlights Stevia's uh, potential to treat various diseases including endocrine, metabolic, immune, and cardiovascular issues. Furthermore, the study reveals Stevia's ability to affect cellular signaling systems by surpassing protein kinase C phosphorylation, which is associated with inflammation and diseases. Notably, Stevia's molecules also interact slowly with the AMP activated protein kinase, showing the potential for treating metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. Know that they have used a multimodal approach combining network pharmacology with in vitro and in vivo techniques. Then, the, what about the therapeutic applications of it? See, it has potential effects on type 1, type 2, autoimmune diabetes and pre-diabetes. Furthermore, it may be useful in autoimmune diseases such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis and chronic kidney diseases. Notably, it could also impact conditions like hypertension, vasculopathy and other cardiovascular diseases. What are the implications for Assam? See, Assam is a major exporter of stevia globally. Significantly, stevia cultivation has potential economic benefits uh, for Northeast Indian economy as noted by the Northeastern Council. Also, the findings were published in Food Bioscience, providing a scientific basis for stevia's use uh, in treating a range of diseases. So, the study encourages further research uh, to explore the full therapeutic potential of stevia. The next article says that the Union Minister of Labour and Employment and Youth Affairs and Sports, 
launched Ishram One Stop Solution in New Delhi today. Union Minister for State for Labour and Employment, Secretary, and other senior officials of the Ministry of Labour and Employment were also present on the occasion. In this context, let us talk about the upgraded Ishram portal. See, the Ministry of Labour and Employment launched an upgraded version of the Ishram portal, making it a one-stop solution for unorganised workers. Significantly, the upgrade integrates a dual social security scheme sir, to provide seamless access to government welfare schemes for registered workers. So, what is the purpose of it? See, the primary goal is to simplify the registration process for unorganised workers and provide easier, more transparent access to welfare schemes. Furthermore, it aims to act as a bridge between the workers and the government's benefits, improving workers' livelihoods and ensuring their well-being. Significantly, it facilitates integration of major government schemes, uh, which are the follows. Some of them are One Nation, One uh, Ration Card, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, National Social Assistance Programme, etc. Know that more schemes are being integrated in line with the Ministry of Labour and Employment's 100-day agenda. If you have to read more about it, do check our Telegram channel for daily current affairs notes uh, for the day. The next article says that India on Monday expressed reservations over facilitator-led process uh, in the World Trade Organization to discuss uh, issues on agriculture, saying that it would potentially undermine ministerial mandates uh, and take negotiations backwards, according to an official. In this context, let us talk about uh, the World Trade Organization. See, the World Trade Organization, in short called the WTO, is the only international organization managing global trade rules uh, with the goal of using trade to improve living standards, create jobs, and promote sustainable development. Know that the WTO agreements signed by the member nations and ratified by their parliaments uh, form the basis uh, for, of these trade rules. If we have to look at the key functions of WTO, the first one is trade rule administration. So it operates a global system of trade rules to help member nations improve their capacity to trade. Furthermore, it provides a platform for members to negotiate the trade agreements and resolve trade disputes. Also, the overall objective is to leverage trade for higher living standards, better jobs, improved lives. The second one is the trade negotiations. Under this, the WTO facilitates negotiations on agreements covering goods, services and intellectual properties. The third one is implementation and monitoring, under which WTO members must make their trade policies transparent, notifying the WTO of any laws or measures in place. So, various committees ensure members comply with the WTO agreements and members undergo periodic reviews of their trade practices by both their governments and the WTO Secretariat. The next one is dispute settlement. So, the WTO's dispute settlement understanding resolves trade disputes, among, trade disputes among the members. Furthermore, independent experts interpret the agreements and commitments, ensuring smooth trade flows uh, by, ensuring, by enforcing rules. The next one is the capacity building for developing countries. See, special provisions for developing countries include extended implementation periods and support for expanding trade opportunities. So the WTO provides training and technical support, helping these nations implement standards and handle the disputes. Also, the Aid for Trade Initiative supports developing countries in improving skills and infrastructure for global trade participation. The last one is the outreach and cooperation. So the WTO maintains dialogue with the non-governmental organizations, parliamentarians, international organizations, media and the public to enhance the cooperation and increase the awareness of its activities. What about its members and observers? See, as of August 30th, 2024, the WTO has 166 members. Know that the organization also has observer countries that are in process of accession. The last article of the day says that the Supreme Court on Monday said secularism is an indelible and core part of the basic structure of the constitution. In this context, let us talk about the Keshwananda Bharati judgment. Firstly, if you look at the background, see the Keshwananda Bharati case was a landmark judgment delivered by the Supreme Court of India on 24th April of 1973. Know that the case was filed by Sri Keshwananda Bharati, the head of a Hindu religious mutt in Kerala, challenging the 24th. 25th and 29th constitutional amendments. Significantly, these amendments aim to curtail the powers of the judiciary and limit certain fundamental rights of citizens. So, what are the key constitutional issues? See, the case questioned whether the parliament had unlimited power to amend any part of the constitution, including the fundamental rights. Furthermore, it addressed whether the judiciary could continue to review and strike down unconstitutional amendments. 
if we have to look at the major rulings, firstly, the Supreme Court established the basic structure doctrine, holding those certain fundamental features of the Constitution such as democracy, secularism, federalism, and rule of law cannot be amended by the Parliament. Significantly, these features form the basic structure of the Constitution and are essential to the integrity. Secondly, it is related to limit, limited power to amend. See, while the Parliament has the power to amend the Constitution under Article 368, this power is not absolute. Amendments that seek to alter or destroy the basic structure are unconstitutional. Thirdly, the judgment reinforced that the judicial review is an integral part of the basic structure and cannot be removed by the parliamentary amendments. So, this ensures that the judiciary retains the power to review and invalidate the amendments that violate the Constitution's core principles. Now, what is the significance of it? See, the Keshwananda Bharati case is highly significant because it established that the parliament cannot alter the constitution's fundamental features, preserving its core values. Also, the ruling served as a check on the power of parliament to make amendments, ensuring that the constitution remains both adaptable to changing times and respectful of its foundational principles. Furthermore, the case has had far-reaching implications for the Indian constitutional law, shaping the trajectory of constitutional amendments and safeguarding the constitution from arbitrary changes. So, in this video, we have discussed 8 articles in total for today. We'll be back again with another video tomorrow. Thank you.